Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. Since 1949, Ruger has embodied the spirit of hunting in America. Ruger firearms are built to deliver the reliable and accurate performance that seasoned veterans demand and new hunters can trust. At Ruger, we believe that hunting is about more than just the thrill of the chase. It's about the freedom and opportunity that come with it. This is our heritage, and this is Ruger. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to the Wild and Uncut podcast. We are on location in hunting camp in Oregon, coming off Antelope. Steens Mountains again. To my right, Nick Stello from Crooked Canyon Productions. He's the guy that like makes me look like I know what I'm doing. Appreciate it's a that. Tough on, job. On my hunts. Tough job. To my left, obviously the man that needs no introduction, the one, the only, JR. Uh last name hunting that's it and also known as my husband Whew, it's windy. mr croc mr croc yeah like your claim to fame literally <laughs> now is like where you go in crocs mm-hmm. and i think what you enjoy most about those crocs is the fact that you got them in the women's department at walmart and they're not even crocs so they're the low budget ones <laughs> they are called time true oh. mm. women's size 11 nice perfect fit yeah works good well we're coming out so this is steen's antelope we hunted this a couple years ago my dad had the tag nick was there for that you were also here for my steen's deer hunt and now we just came off of my steen's antelope and so with oregon the kind of unique thing is you can't hardly draw an antelope tag so yeah. It's, it's like 16 twice, points. twice in a lifetime, you know, kind of deal. Uh, three times in a lifetime kind of thing. And so, you know, with Yoki and I having moved to Oregon, we're just doing a cash out season where this was a tag that I was familiar with the unit and I, I could use my 16 years worth of points mm-hmm. and draw an antelope tag. Yep. 16. Kinda and crazy. who's not here right now that was on all three of those hunts also is Robbie Redmond. Yeah. My dad's buddy from school and a family friend and you know Robbie's so awesome he brought his mules up here we did not use them once (laughs) uh but we had his mules he packed out the deer force a couple years ago Mm -hmm. and and him and dad and I and you rode around on some donkeys here in the woods and uh but and he he left early this morning so he's not on the podcast but he was here with us and part of the adventure as always so yeah the viewers are going to miss some really educational stories there I, the one i really enjoyed last night was the one in camp the the little uh, trivia he sat down to uh, draw your memory <laughs> last night we will not talk about how that exercise unfolded but uh it was it was pretty funny i like the one better about his mule kicking him in the crotch <laughs> yeah, that was, oh, so with Robbie, I had a mule when I was 16. I got him as a two-year-old, and his name was Jester, and he's a big black mule, and we also bought his brother, and um, the two brothers just beat the crud out of each other constantly, and they were just battling the two of them. I mean, they, like, literally were, like, taking chunks. What is that sound? <laughs> Do you have that sound? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just some sort of interference. Static. The oh, phone right my there. phone ringing? Hold on. Airplane mode. Yeah, maybe it is my phone. Yeah, Airplane mode. Yeah. It's, what is that interface? <gasps> Airplane mode. Okay. Hmm? Still not liking it. Don't put it there. It's fine now. Okay. Airplane mode it. Okay. So we had the two mules and they were just like literally beating each other. And one of them, Chester took a bite at a jester. And like literally took a chunk out of him. Like his wither is permanently bruised where this mule, they just beat each other up. So we sold Robbie the black mule named Jester, which had been my mule. And 
And he went and did a bunch of fancy, like, horsemanship classes and was going to come home and round pin jester and <laughs> teach him how to lunge and all the stuff I did with him when we were training him. And jester went around in circles with him a couple of times, and there was lots of green grass on the ground. And finally he had enough of Robbie, and he just hauled him right in the junk. Just kicked him <laughs> right in the junk. Moneymaker shot. Oh, nailed him. Bruised him from knee to... You know what? Cut it. Cut his family jewels. <laughs> cut them. Bruise them and cut them. He had to go to the emergency room. And he had a one inch cut in his main man unit. And I don't even know why I'm telling the story. It's really but good. You got to finish it. They out. had. Yeah, don't leave the best part out. Yeah. They, they gave him an option of do we want stitches or do you want to do super glue in your main unit there? And Robert, I guess, chose the. The super glue version, which which was fine until you know, you tell them. Everybody until you woke up for in the morning or something with the, um, yes, that uh, glorious morning wood. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> the glue started, you know, giving way, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to leave it, it about there. It doesn't flex. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this story, oh my gosh, like to listen to him tell this story. Yeah. That's it's, pretty funny. Oh, you, <laughs> when he tells it, you can just see the pain. Well, you can't imagine the pain, though. You can see the pain in his eyes when yeah. he tells the story. So. And and the, the miracle thing is that the mule is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. No. <laughs> and has never kicked him since, I don't think. He just told him. <laughs> he just put him in his place. He's yeah. like, dude, you're not going to put me in this round pin and make me run in circles. Mm-hmm. Like, uh-uh. Yeah, well, that's funny. I ain't having that. <laughs> but him and Jester, it was interesting because he'd never had mules when he when we sold him Jester. And, and Jester is like a bulldozer, you know, similar to the rest of my mules. And those two just battled. Uh, it was pretty funny. But they're they're still battling, but I think they kind of have it ironed out now. Nick's, yeah. Nick's witnessed a lot of the Robbie and Dad stories. And, oh, oh, man, boy. yeah. They are quite the duo. <laughs> they're fun to have in camp. They make really good margaritas at the end of the night. Yes. Oof. We're kind of missing yeah. that. So if you have one of my dad's margaritas, like literally, you it's like, do you want to walk or crawl? Just ask your mom. Or no, crawl or stumble. St- well, I don't even. <laughs> there's not even an option beyond. Just crawling, ask your mom. Yeah, I know, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my dad made my mom a margarita, and <laughs> she doesn't remember anything. <laughs> that was that, it. You have to watch out for those because <laughs> that's the special mix when he doesn't use margarita mix, but he uses margarita wine. Yeah. Oh, so it's just wow. alcohol and alcohol. What? Yeah. yeah. No. Well, we ran out of regular margarita mix, so we made my mom a margarita with oh margarita my wine. Oh, gosh. Just. <laughs> if I, you might guys, to, I might have to come to the next Dean's Hunt just to have I'm one I'm telling those. you, you guys are missing out on hunting with my dad and Robbie. It's pretty fun. Those two are so entertaining. It's like uh, they just give each other such a hard time all the time. And so yeah. makes it makes it. I mean, that's what hunting camp is all about. Oh, right? yeah. Just Flicking your buddy's shit. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had an awesome hunt here um this week and uh like it's it's so hot yeah like brutal the antelope are even bedding in the shade it's so hot like yeah that's how you know it's hot because last year they didn't they bedded in the wide open yeah they were you were here last year with my cousin ben on an antelope hunt yeah and it was still brutally tough hunt but they when mid-afternoon you could still go hunt because they bedded in the open but 95 100 degrees they're hitting the timber Mm -hmm. which is is really hard to find them yeah yeah and this this trip you know this unit is really you know it used to be known for giant like world-class mule deer and great pronghorn and to dig out an antelope over 13 inches in this unit is a (laughs) is a real chore now yeah your cousin put on 2500 miles last year yeah and I think he shot a 14. Yeah. 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 And he's a dang good hunter. Yeah. I put him up against the best and yeah, it was tough. Yeah. And that's, it's his home turf too. I mean, yeah, he, he lives, he lives here. Yeah. So, I mean, he knows it <laughs> yeah. and he can scout yeah. it anytime. Yeah. 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 It's a tough unit now. I mean, you, the name of the game here is Miles. Yeah. And the first time we hunted at Nick, uh, for deer together, we didn't, I didn't own a side by side. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we <laughs> we were out here, we had a pickup, and then Robbie came, and we had mules, and we were at such a disadvantage. The roads out here are just horrible. 
Well, and then, you know, you're walking and you have 20 quads zoom by you or you're on a donkey. Yeah. And, you know, you just don't, you don't have the advantage of over other hunters if no. you can't cover the ground. No, the side-by-side was a saving grace on this one. Especially, For sure. Especially if there's three of you. You know, if there's only two, a quad would do it, right. like a regular quad. Yeah. But side-by-side side for us is perfect because you can fit all of us in there. Even four people with Robbie, yeah. I would sit on the back. And then you can load so much stuff yeah, on the back. Yeah, ice and, and drinks yeah. and a cooler. And, and a dead antelope. Mm-hmm. Ooh, shakalakalaka. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really interesting how this unit's changed. And um, there, and, and it's supposed to be, like, kind of wildernessy, But we were using Onyx uh, to find roads. And it was crazy because these roads are in on X and no one else was on them. No. It's like nobody's really using that technology. Well, not no one, but the general majority of people are not using on X the way it could be used. I think it's a combination of the number of years it takes to draw this tag. The generation, a lot of the gen- yeah. people that draw it are older yeah. Yeah. generation, a lot of on a hunt. and they yeah. won't use Onyx. Plus, then also because it's so hot, a lot of people don't want to get out of the aircon in their truck, and yeah. then they don't go onto those roads that are rough. Where we go on the side by side, and yeah. nobody else goes, which is nice. You get yeah. away from people. On the main road, you're driving past people every two minutes. Yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah, you know that was that was one of the things that we were talking about. Just the difference in my dad and Robbie, how they hunt versus how we hunt. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Robbie, there's a spot that my dad and I both have killed antelope out here. And and Robbie is just of that mindset like, hey, let's get on the mules. You guys take off hiking and we'll just ride out there and see if we can stumble into antelope. And we're like, ah, you know, we're going to go up, get a vantage point, (laughs) and we're going to spend two hours glassing. And if we see antelope... We'll go there, but if we don't, we're not going there. Yeah. And the mindset is just really different. Uh, like the dependency that we have on technology is so different yeah. than them. Yeah. We let our eyes do the walking. Yeah. Yeah. And we got lucky because, you know, Yogi was spotting stuff literally like 15 miles away. That we could say, okay, well, there's a group of, we saw one or two antelope here, one or two over here. Chances are there's more than one or two. Right. Right. And, I mean, you, you, you get a good viewpoint, you glass, and then you use your onyx to map out the, the road route. system. And, you, you know, if you, can, if you can even get into that place legally uh, with a side-by-side. And, you know, obviously if there's antelope in there, you go in. Yeah. And you might find stuff that you don't see from that viewpoint but still you know where to go for a start because you've seen animals and it's always a good starting point yeah right well we use onyx and we went around on one stock the antelope were right off the main road and there was two other hunters pulled over right behind us glassing them and they're sitting there on the main road looking at them and we went on onyx and found a a road a two-track road an open road um because you can't go off road here um and we looped clear around the antelope and then we did the dumb thing, which wasn't so dumb. It was a great strategy. But we hiked two and a half miles mm-hmm. in to where the antelope were. And, man, we were so close. Like, yeah, right idea. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just but it wasn't, it wasn't the right buck. No, yeah. it wasn't. But it was a good plan, and it yeah. worked. It, it actually work. worked the way we wanted it to work up until the last 50 h- yards. 200 yards. <laughs> 50 yards. Right, because we didn't pin where he was sitting under the tree when we saw him. And that was a mistake. And we then, should have set know, a pin. You go walk and it looks different. Mm-hmm. And we couldn't find them. We were off yeah. like by 100 yards. And I stop, pull off my backpack. I get out a a hero drink and I drink it. And I'm doing like this on camera mm-hmm. thing. Like, oh, they must have winded us because the wind was it horrible. Was horrible. Yeah, right at our backs. So and I'm like, oh, they're gone. Da, da, da. And we walk 75 yards and the antelope stand up from under a tree right in front of us. It's like, boo. <laughs> but that was actually, I mean... You know, like you were saying, there's two other trucks pulled up, pulled up and started glassing that same flat yeah. from the main road. Even though they saw those animals, they they couldn't get to them no. from where we are on the main road because it's it's still like 2,500 
yards out. Yeah. yeah. Of, you just know? wide open space. A and you can't open. get there. They will see you, right? Yeah. And there's so many animals out there. That look, like with all the wild, wild horses here too, they'll, they'll spook and everything will yeah. just run off. So that was the best way to get to those animals we've, that we figured out with that um, – with Onyx around the back way and then walking in. Yeah. yeah. And I mean... Yeah, because we hit a road closure and then... Right. It, it not e- th- There was a road right in there all the way, but it was... It was closed off closed. for motorized vehicles. Yeah. yeah. So we just hiked from the gate. So that's yeah. perfect. I mean... Yeah, it worked good. Yeah. They have um, like 50 million wild horses yeah. out here. It's absolutely tragic. Um, like we've heard rumor that they have taken wild horses out of a neighboring unit what do they say, Beatty's Butte or something mm-hmm, like that? Mm-hmm. And uh, we heard that they brought between three and 600 horses in here and dropped them. And we've seen... On top of what they already had. Uh, yeah, and we have literally seen hundreds and hundreds of horses. And the shameful thing is that these feral horses, you'll have between 50 and 100 of them standing at a water hole. They're standing in the water. They're defecating in the water. They're hogging the water, and they don't let... They're so aggressive, they're not really letting the other animals in. Now, we did see them let some antelope in mm-hmm. the other day, but they're so aggressive, and they are everywhere, and they're destroying it. Like, the place that we did the the two-and-a-half-mile hike, the the ground was so beaten down from these horses that it was like moon dust. Yeah. And the sagebrush is struggling to survive, and the grass is just mm-hmm. wiped out. And, I mean, these these horses, this is like a major problem and, and they have them fenced into these like pen areas almost, and and it's I mean this is not it is it is a terrible tragedy what is happening with these horses. Yeah. And and I'm an advocate, you know, if you want a horse, don't go spend five thousand dollars on a on a weanling horse or whatever. Go freaking buy one of these feral horses, and they'll give you like a couple grand to adopt them. Or you can buy a trained one and just start consuming this resource that we have because we have a problem. I mean, if people, you know, just if you're just looking for a horse to go ride in the mountains, go adopt one of these feral horses because we've got to do something with them. Mm -hmm. We're looking at getting one. Yeah. Because we need another horse eventually. But the the thing they did with relocating them here it doesn't make any sense. None. I mean, you're just moving the problem into a different area. Yeah. like with us hunting here, the number of tags they put out for this unit, and it's a 16-year wait for most people. And there's 110 tags, roughly. 110 tags, Ish. and you see maybe 20 to 30 antelope a day. If I you think put on we a, saw more than most people. But yeah, but I'm saying, like, if you hunt hard, you see 20 to 30 antelope a day, maybe five decent bucks among those, right? But you see 300 horses. Yeah. I mean, it's it's frustrating. It doesn't make any sense. And we didn't see any elk. We saw few deer. 40 or 4 bucks. And some does spread out, but it's not much. No, no. but the, the amount of does that we saw, I can count on two hands. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the amount of bucks that we saw, I can count on two hands. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, and then you see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of horses yeah. everywhere. Like, it's just, it, it's mind-blowing. There, there's a major problem. And, and we have, it's all under the pretense of them being wild horses, which are not. They're no, feral they're horses. Feral. So it's like, okay, you want to start releasing cattle and then turning them feral, and then you have wild cattle, yeah. too? It doesn't make sense, you know. No. It's And it's frustrating for people that really want to, you know, support conservation and stuff because yeah. that it, it works against it. Yeah. Because you saw what they did to the landscape, it's it's like desert out here. Well, it is desert, and then well, you in put a way, that on but then that, that on top, it just yeah. destroys it. Yeah, it just made it a lot worse. Yeah. It's insane. Like I can't believe the damage that we saw mm-hmm. um, to the landscape from them. Yeah. And I and I like I said, I love horses. I'm all about the horses. I want to pet them and touch them and ride them and do all those things. But there has to be a point where you're like, this is insanity and Mm -hmm. this is not, this is counterproductive to any sort of land stewardship program. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And wildlife stewardship is just crazy. And then, you know, Oregon, (laughs) I can go into 10 million reasons why we moved to Wyoming, but the predator management here, I mean, is, is a major problem. Last time my dad and I were here, we were just a couple miles out of camp and we were archery elk hunting and 
on our back track coming out, we had mountain lion tracks on our human tracks. Yeah. And mountain lions were, were you know, we had a cat actively, you know, following us or whatever. Um, at some point, we didn't know until we came out and saw them on our the tr- uh, tracks on our back tracks. And, you know, without being able to hunt with dogs in here, it's, it's, lions have just done real damage to our deer herds too. Yeah. Then they got to hire a guy with dogs to come in and kill some. Yeah. W- then yeah. they allegedly brought in a government trapper, we were told or heard, and they took out a hundred cats and paid a government trapper to do it. And, you know, you have hunters that would gladly pay and, you know, harvest the meat, which a lot of people are like, oh, you don't eat mountain lion, but there's a lot of people you've eaten mountain oh, lion. Oh, it's really good. Yeah, we, we've uh, made sausage from mountain lion. It's really good. Yeah. It's yeah. like pork. Yeah, it's really good and lean. It's really good meat, actually. And but to get back to what you were saying about them having to hire a government trapper to kill the cats out of here, same with the horses. I mean, why do you relocate them from a unit to here and then you do a roundup and then you auction them off or call them out? I mean, you could have done that in the first unit. Yeah. yeah. When you have them in a trailer already, anyway, it's like why would you relocate them first? It's weird. It politics, weird. obviously. It doesn't make any sense. No. So. no, and they have no natural predators, and they just breed and breed and breed cats, and breed. Cats will take the young ones sometimes. Not often, though. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I... We've seen them on the mountain lion hunts uh, we do in Nevada. We've seen... Because there's a lot of wild ho- feral horses in Nevada. They have a really big issue with it, too. Um, we've seen horse horses killed by lions. We found them. Well, you know it's a cat kill because they have the, the mark on the neck, the two, the the, the canine yeah. marks on the neck. But it's not very many that do that. It has to be a big cat. Yeah. To kill a horse. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think our strategy on this hunt was pretty good. It was cover miles. Oh, yeah. And don't stop. <laughs> Just mile after mile after mile and after mile. And we did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not as many as my cousin had to last year. He just hunted more days, but he yeah. just, we got lucky and we found got the right lucky. one early. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, we got super lucky. We So we've seen, I don't know, how many antelope bucks do you think we've seen? Big ones or? Just bucks. Any bucks? Probably 20 to 30. Yeah, 20, 25 I think our bucks. final night going out, we were right around 25. Yeah. Bucks. And then we saw yeah. another three yeah. or four. Yeah. Yeah. That night yeah. on our stock and all that. Mike. And the. Sorry, go ahead. My cousin had spotted a buck on this one mountain, and he's like, yeah, go go there. You know, I found a pretty decent buck there. And we went there, and we, we passed on him, and it was like, ooh, ooh, he's pretty nice looking, and he was close. And, you know, we, we kind of thought about it, but we let him go. And then I sent a picture of the buck to my cousin. He's like, yeah, I think that's the buck I saw. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I just passed on the buck that... <laughs> Well, he was, he's cool looking and he's yeah. definitely yeah. a shooter for most people, yeah. but we'd said already, we want to, we want to spend some time and, you know, you wanted to find something, try to find something that was above average, whether that means, you know, in length or whatever, character. or character. And then, you know, when we found this one, it was a no brainer. I yeah. mean, that's like one in a million, that kind of buck, you know? Well, I don't know. Ben killed one last year, so I don't well, think he's yeah, one in a but million, I mean, but... Two that's a saying. Okay, that's a saying. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but maybe one in a hundred yeah. then. Yeah. Well, the yeah. unique thing about the buck we found, um, Yogi spotted where these antelope were from like 15 miles away. Something like that, yeah. 10 to 15 miles, I guess. Yeah. yeah. It was a and long ways out. With your spotting scope. And we got sidetracked hunting the ones that we did the big... On the big flat. Big yeah. flat hike. And we uh, had to go to town for ice cream at lunchtime, so that's <laughs> always important. <laughs> but... We were just like, oh, let's just go check that out. We, you know, you saw a couple in the spotting scope, and we went out there, and then you spotted this buck. Um, and we just really got lucky. We just He was bedded down in the sagebrush when we zoomed by on the side-by-side, and he jumped up and just took off boiling out of there. Um, not too crazy, but he was going. And yeah, but they do that, you know. Yeah. And it looked like they had b- those animals had been living in a little kind of – drainage out of sight from that from main that two road. track and from the main road no, you couldn't see him i mean from that viewpoint on top we we could have seen them and most likely we did see some of them that morning um but like people driving by there they would never see no. them no and so that that saved those the, well that and the other thing especially. we got lucky is he ran and where he ran there was does mm-hmm. 
So um, they, he stopped and so joined, stopped joined them, yeah. Them. But then, you know, we're set up, and this is the problem we had the other day when we did the big hike, was bumping wild hor- feral horses. And then last night we had the same thing. There's a big herd of feral horses with the goats. And, you know, we're looking up in our optics, and here comes these horses. And I'm like, <laughs> frick. You know, we have lots of time. The antelope are feeding, and, you know, this is going to happen. And then here comes these feral horses, and I'm... Right between us and the goats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just thinking, oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> if the horses spook, the goats are going to oh, run. Oh, f- yeah. yeah. Guaranteed. And they are not, you know, people think wild horses, they see humans, it's fine. No. They are as cagey as the antelope or worse. Worse. Mm. Well, yeah. they run, and they don't stop. They're yes. like psychos. Like a cow, if you spook a cow, it'll run 50 yards, 80 yards, and stop and look at you, and then you can eventually just zoom by mm-hmm. it. These horses run and run and run and yeah. run. And they're clear a valley out for you. Blow, yeah. you know, like horses do that whole, you know, thing and they blow and they're, it's just awful. And yeah, I was like, oh, the last thing I wanted to see was horses. I mean, it was crazy because like we saw them come at us and then they must have just gotten in the terrain and. Yeah, they just looped around. Us, just yeah. looped around us and we just got lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think they got on a horse trail that like one of their trails and just followed that up, and that was luckily that didn't go right past it, that that uh, past us that just went up, yeah, that drainage. So, and then we could close the distance to from 600 with us moving and the goats feeding kind of towards angling towards us. us up that drainage too. We closed it from 600 to 320, 320. I think is what you shot. Yeah. So that's perfect. It yeah. worked out really good. Yeah, and I had my. Uh, my tripod rest, which I've shot since 2017. We filmed all of our shows pretty much end up shooting off that thing. And um, I have it set up with a little binocular rest. I can take my tripod. I can use it for my spotting scope. I can use it for my binos. And then when it's time for me to shoot, I just use my bino rest as a shooting rest. And I was able to get kneeling and throw my shooting elbow on my knee. And I was super steady. And uh, one shot and that thing was just knee. just went feet straight to its stomach and down. Toast, yeah. It was toast. Hammered yeah. him. Yeah. It was awesome. <laughs> and it did not, literally didn't take a step. <laughs> and it was crazy because I'm using the Silencer Central Banish 30. And that's the first animal I've shot uh, suppressed. Mm-hmm. And it was crazy because the does he was with, when we shot, they ran, I don't know, 50 yards, yep. 80 yards, and they stopped. And they're just like looking around. They had no idea what happened. Like, it was the craziest thing. Like we could have shot a second antelope, we had a second tag. Yeah. Like it was. It was crazy how mm-hmm. how little it affected um, the antelope. Yeah. And they're such a spooky animal. Yeah. yeah. No, that was perfect. And he mm-hmm. did drop in his tracks. Yeah. He didn't he's go. quite the looker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's super cool. Yeah, yeah. He's 16 inches wide. <laughs> wide. Yeah. Nuts. Wide, like just super wide, and then. He, his horns don't go up either. They go like straight, straight out. forward too. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Like when we first saw him driving down the road, and he 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 popped up. He was looking straight at us, and he was up on the hillside. So he's looking down at us, and because his horns go straight out, it looked like a young buck because it, they weren't any taller than the ears. You know the way he was standing and facing us. It's like, oh damn it, is that a young buck? <laughs> and then he turns and it's like those big things sticking out the front of his head. It's like super oh! white, you know. And then you're like, you gotta come see <laughs> yeah. this. You gotta come see this. And I looked at him and I was yeah. like, let's do it. And then I dump your spotting scope, <laughs> <laughs> face first in the dirt. I'm a good wife like that. Oh yeah. Uh, hey, anything for the cause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. But that worked out perfectly. It did. And he disappeared over that little hump and then dropped into that drain- basin, drainage, that yeah. little basin there where the does were, and that helped us you know get up there and then we got another good look and he'd settled down well this is the disparity that i have out here is i'm short and nick how tall are you six four yogi six one i think okay so i'm five three and so they're (laughs) they're looking in the sagebrush oh yeah he's right there and i'm like hmm where is he (laughs) can you get down on my level and it was really it's actually pretty remarkable how much less i can see it is weird than you guys yeah like yeah like it's incredible like nick you were able to watch the buck and then i was set up on shooting sticks and 
you're like, okay, he's behind the stage, da da da. He's gonna step out with that dough, and so I could kind of like, I had the gap in the stage where the dough was, so I knew where the buck was coming. But otherwise, I would have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> no, because I, I couldn't see him. Like, um, short lady problems. I was. You can also look at it this way: you can sneak up uh, on them a lot easier because you're short. You 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 stay hidden in the stage. <laughs> 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 no it was it was fun though i mean we we uh i dialed it i'm running the night force atec r 7 to 35 this is like the cat daddy of all rifle scopes it's nice yeah. it's a life ruiner it's so amazing yeah but having that extra magnification when he was 600 yards you know, i could really look at the antelope um not that i could see him because he was my brush but i could really look at the does and you know you can really mm-hmm. check out everything and and get a good view. Um, great shot. It was like literally just. That's perfect. And it was cool because the the firearm is so quiet with that suppressor. It was, and then, whack! That impact was so yeah. mm-hmm. loud because normal. I think you're still like if you have a muzzle break on, you're like mm. rattled from the sound. Right. That you don't hear that hit. That that was the loudest thump I've ever heard. From an but you hit him hard too. Oof. That's why he dropped. <laughs> Just <laughs> dumped him. Yeah, and it because he was angled a little towards us. Yeah. So it didn't go straight through him. It went through him on an angle. Yeah, and so out of his stomach. Yeah. yeah. So you had a lot of. Uh, it uh, went clear through his body. It hit energy lungs. Energy that hit him in the in the in the boiler room. Yeah. Well, it hit him in the lungs and then came out his stomach. Just. Poof. Yeah. Yeah. His lungs were gelled when Nick and I gutted him out yeah. last night. He was just like. I was like, oh my gosh, look at his lungs. They were like petrified. (laughs) Yeah. But his heart was intact. Like it was, and I never hit him in the heart. And you would think with how he reacted, I would have heart shot him. But yeah. No matter where you pursue the wild, never leave home without Onyx Hunt. Onyx gives hunters the confidence to apply and draw tags in areas they've never set foot in, extending hunting seasons and opportunities. Always know where you stand with public and private land layers, unit boundaries, and more. Onyx can even be downloaded directly to your phone for use when you don't have service. Wherever you pursue the wild, hunt with Onyx. So you were shooting your 6.5 Creedmoor? Yeah, I have uh, on this gun, well, excuse me, on this trip, and last year I used it once, Magpul has the... um, the Hunter series stocks, and I was shooting that on this trip. Um, I like it. it's got adjustable length of pull, adjustable cheek comb, and it's just a pretty sexy looking gun. Yeah. I mean, it looks really, really good suppressed. It's got a the this American uh, Ruger American in six five. It's super super short barrel, so like over my other some of my other six fives that I shoot for like competition. It's about 100 feet a second slower um, because the barrel's short. But um, but it's a nice kind of compact rifle. And I like that shorter barrel because when I throw my suppressor on, it's not like as tall as me. Um, but I guess the Banish 30, if you want to take it down from a 9, you can shrink it down, I think, to a 7. So if you want a shorter suppressor, you can do that too. But um, I'm really happy with how that performed. And 6.5 Creedmoor is a great cartridge for, for antelope for sure. Oh, yeah does pretty good in the wind and um and everything so and it I mean it was plenty of knockdown for for what we needed oh yeah 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 good and long range cartridge and yeah big enough for the antelope no problem yeah and no Obviously. recoil on it you know it was just what I, I know it's crazy too like what that's one thing you know this is the first time i've hunted suppressed my hair in my mouth sorry and one of the struggles i have is my dad is so um deaf and it, it's really nice to not have to worry now as much about my ears when I'm hunting being suppressed and when what's cool about silencer centrals if you live in one of the 42 states that you can have suppressed uh, suppressors they'll deliver them right to your door um after you pass the paperwork and background checks and do all that but they they make it easy either if they're at a million shows so if you're at one you can go there do all your fingerprints they do it for you or um they'll send you the paperwork and do it for you Mm -hmm. uh, to your house so it's super easy and man I wish I would have started hunting suppressed sooner yeah like, I feel stupid, <laughs> honestly, not having done it before. Well, we did in Sweden. In Sweden, yeah. yeah. But yeah. it's easy. In Sweden, you just walk into a gun store and you buy a suppressor now. Right now, they changed it. It used to be like here where you had to wait three months and you had to get a separate license. Well, for here, it used to take a year. <laughs> right. Or more. But yeah, now they're trying to, Sweden their had electronic s- forms are making it faster. Sweden had a very similar system where you had to 
apply for a separate license for every suppressor yeah. you wanted. Um, and you would have to have a license for a rifle in the caliber that that suppressor would fit on. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to get one. Yeah. Um, now they changed it to where buying a suppressor is as easy as buying ammunition. So you need a l to show proof of uh, a license for a certain caliber of a rifle, and then you can buy am ammo for that caliber or a suppressor for that caliber. You just walk in and buy one. Yeah, so. but you have to have licenses. Yeah. I don't like this whole license thing. <laughs> Let's keep that in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> Let's keep that in Europe. But, I mean, we're there with suppressors, unfortunately. It's a, you know, a super regulated thing. But, um, I mean, especially if you have kids, you want your kids to really enjoy a hunt. I mean, putting a suppressor on the rifle kicks down the recoil, makes the sound yeah, just a sound. Yeah, a lot less nice. scary for them. Well, and not only that, but, like, standing next to someone that is, when you're hunting and they're shooting a muzzle brake, that... Yeah, it rocks, yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. just kids, but people in general that are new to shooting firearms. Yeah. You know, getting them into that sport um, is a lot easier with suppressors. Yeah. Because it does make it a lot less scary and more enjoyable to... You saw that at your training for yeah. the... Yeah, well, our, our Women of America. Yeah, yeah, recently. They really enjoyed it, yeah. shooting those rifles with the suppressors and, you know, yeah. like, because a lot of those had those women had never shot firearms before. Yeah. Yeah, so. and then you give them a little Ruger Precision Rimfire, and you have a Banish twenty two suppressor on it, and mm -hmm. top it off with a Night Force NX eight. <laughs> Those ladies were driving Cadillacs for that class. It was <laughs> yeah. fun, mm -hmm. and, and what a fun firearm to learn to shoot on. It was really great, and you know, one thing that I am kind of like, I really, I would to, like last night when we when we shot the antelope, I'm getting ready to shoot a tripod, you know, kneeling shot at 320 yards which is not a hard shot um for me at this point but I, I i was thinking about it when we were walking out there like i had my tripod and i'm like man i haven't shot positionally like trained since last spring like when i shot nrl hunter matches and um I, you i really had kind of taken for granted you know shooting two or three matches how much it would prepare me for this mentally mm -hmm. and just with managing my equipment and my gear and not that I made any mistakes last night but I really I was actually kind of nervous because I hadn't practiced with the move and everything we've been so busy yeah. um that I didn't shoot any of those matches this year and I, and I that's not something I want to do again I want to make sure that I definitely get to a hunter match next year yeah. like it makes a big difference like just to have that confidence of oh, I've I've shot two matches and I ran the crud out of my tripod and yeah, a little more muscle memory. Versus, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and shooting is such a per perishable skill, um, just like anything. That you know, you can be the best in the world, and and if some guy is out training you, then they're gonna be better than you. It doesn't matter what you were yesterday; it matters what you are today. And I really, um, I was really actually kind of nervous about that, especially when he was first at six hundred yards. Nick, you were like implying, you're like, well, I couldn't see the antelope. And you're like, well, could you stand up and do the shot? You know, like frick, 600 yards that's standing a, on a tripod. That's a long poke. I'm like, you know, no. <laughs> I mean, you've done those at well, the Adderall sure. matches, yeah. but it's still a lot, especially at a living yeah. creature, Animal. right? Yeah. You're yeah. like, mm. we filmed the limitations video. Remember yeah. that one time? Yeah. And standing at 600 was about where it was getting a little That wonky. was where it got sketchy. Yeah. And so that's what I love about those matches too, is it really helps you identify ethically what your boundaries are yeah. when you get in a situation because you're excited and you have you know an animal that you know like for us in that situation we've been hunting all week and I was like man I just no I'm not doing it you know and like let's just be patient we'll try to get closer we'll do something different um and what I actually did set up once kneeling when the buck was at like what 520 mm -hmm. and I was contemplating taking the shot but I had a floating elbow and I was like, uh, I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, my elbow's just too unstable. And I had Yogi put my backpack between my knee and my elbow to try to get another point of contact. And I just, it just wasn't there for me. And, and, it's th and I think that, you know, a lot of people, it's pretty easy to be like, I'm just going to try, just pull the shot, you know, right. and they miss or, you know, put a bad shot on and, and I'd rather just not do it. And so I was like, no, no, this isn't going to work. And then, and then I was like, man, if we could get to that next layer 
because there's another little rise. I'm like, we could get that next rise. I think I could get like full kneeling and lock an elbow. And that's what we did. We crawled yeah. to the next rise, but we got lucky because as we crawled towards the antelope, the antelope actually fed kind of towards us. And so when we gained, you know, 80 yards or whatever, they gained 150 yards. Yeah, they were hauling. Yeah. And it just brought the shot um, to 320. Pretty much cut it in half from where. Where I originally yeah. started, yeah. And then I could put my elbow, like, comfortably on my knee because I could have my tripod low enough. And, I mean, I, I when I was on the antelope, um, I was super steady. And that's one thing, too, with antelope. Um, last time I had this tag, my dad and Robbie and I were out here hunting, and there was, like, five antelope in a line, heads down feeding. And there was two bucks that were, like, super similar both really nice bucks and it was like buck number four and buck number three and my dad and I are going back and forth which one and they're weaving in and out feeding and my dad's like okay the bigger one is is number four and I'm like are you sure and he's like yeah and I shoot and I shot the fifth buck because there was one out front (laughs) that I didn't see that my dad could see I couldn't see in my field of view in my optic and I shot a 12 inch <laughs> I shot a 12 inch antelope it was tiny and there's these hammers standing there and my dad's like shoot he's standing there you missed and I'm like what are you talking about is that thing dumped yeah. and I shot the wrong one so last <laughs> night I'm like I look I'm like t- I checked with Nick and Yogi like 10 times like okay I want to make sure and then I made sure he picked his head up at least once so I could like visualize like identify and make sure and then we just kept communicating and luckily, we weren't rushed. We had tons of time. They had no idea we were there. Yeah. Perfect wind. Yeah. Like, solid, like, five-mile-an-hour wind in our face. Mm-hmm. It was perfect. That's a perfect setup. It's always the best when the animals are calm and they don't know you're there. And, yeah. You know, preferably feeding towards you. It's even yeah. better because they're closing the distance. But if, they don't, if they're not aware of you, it's perfect because you can take your time. The only thing that we were, you know, running against was daylight. daylight. Yeah. That's the only thing, but we still had a good, good enough time. Yeah, we barely had time to do a couple photos last night. Yeah. Like it was... The way it goes. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah I was going to do a a video for Hunters Connect on field dressing and... Ha! Negative! <laughs> <laughs> negative! Did not happen. We just ran out of light. Like big time. Yeah. That's, that's part of hunting at night, I guess. You know, if you... Run out of lights. A good problem. We had dinner at midnight last night. Yeah. <laughs> it's like perfect. It's the first day. Today is the first day we slept in until about seven or eight. Eight. We slept till eight. It was nice. Yeah. It was super <laughs> nice. And so the thing is, like this morning, if I didn't shoot that antelope last night, we were getting ready to do like a massive haul. Clear across. This is a huge unit. Giant. Like there's some spots of this unit from where we're camped right now to hunt the other edge of the unit is a five hour drive around and we were like gonna go hunt a midway point and we did it the other day but we got there at like seven and then by the time we got into where we wanted to hunt it was like 8 30 pushing nine and the bucks were bedding down by 10 yeah we ran out of morning yeah we saw a lot of antelope though Ton. yeah it's a good spot great spot saw that one that we kind of contemplated and then this morning if we wouldn't have shot that one last night we were going to get up at 3 a.m <laughs> so we could get over there and have some hunting time because it's so hot they're bedding down so early mm-hmm. and then they won't get up until like four thirty, the earliest yeah well even last night yesterday we went and got ice and ice, uh, cream. ice cream and, and fuel. fuel came back to camp and we sat here and chilled until like 5 30 mm-hmm. like just we didn't get in a hurry but it was perfect by the time we got out there the antelope were just getting up and starting to move and things happened quick it's perfect. Yeah. And it's also crazy how far you walk or travel when you're excited and you don't realize it. <laughs> yeah. You mean on Just the storm? hauling out to them, yeah. Yeah, like last mm-hmm. night. Like, I didn't realize how far we walked until it was time to come back. Like, holy smokes, we were, like, because you're so excited, adrenaline pumping, and, like, you're looking right. and going and looking and going. This and terrain is really deceiving. Like, when we saw him go over the rise, it just looked like one... Gen- like one slope going up to the rise and then this when we got up there was like little uh dips in there and everything you know it's you don't even see from 
where you start off, you know, and then you get up there and it's totally different. And totally. you look over the top and there's a whole other valley. Yeah, I was like, that was awesome. And those trees we, th- we thought were on the skyline where he went over, like that was our kind of waypoint to go towards. They were on the, n- the, the ridge behind them yeah. when we got yeah. over the top. You know, <laughs> it's like yeah. so deceiving. Yeah. But th- that's how these an- uh, animals survive out here, out of sight from hunters, right? Because yeah. there's a lot of hunting pressure here because there's a lot of tags issued every year. And they just have to be in one of those little draws that yeah. you can't see from the main road where most people hunt from. Yeah. yeah. And they make it, which is which is good, obviously. But you know, if you yeah, they know where to go. Right. Because yeah. there's no pressure, they stay there. This buck was just. I don't know if he was headed for water or something. He was, you know, cruising that ridge yeah. and just happened to do it at the wrong time. And it was interesting because <laughs> the other day when we we spotting scope we hit the well we found some antelope and hit the spotting scope and there was a a small buck with like 13 does and they hit the the top of the ridge and they just like disappeared and here comes a pickup truck they never even saw those antelope like they were there 30 seconds before and by the time they drove by us we just kind of waved and they never saw the antelope and then the antelope we went and saw I don't even know if they saw any of those. Like we went and saw like thirty something bucks on or antelope on one ridge, and I, and and there was a truck that had beat us in there, mm-hmm. and out. And it just goes to show you that just because one hunter's cruised through, like I don't let that scare me away from going down no, the road. No, no, and that that's the thing too. You you don't know what they are capable of in terms of glassing and finding game. You know they might just look briefly and then they're done with it right yeah and then the other thing is hunting out of a truck your field of view is restricted yeah especially when you're driving along right because you have the cab and everything like in a, in a side by side on a quad or on foot it's way easier because you, you can look everywhere and you're not obstructed by anything so it's an advantage for sure plus you can get more places obviously and so, faster and faster yes so much faster these roads are really rough <laughs> in some yeah. places Amen to that. You might need a new skid plate under that ATV. <laughs> just saying. I just had it serviced. Uh, so it looks like I'm going to need tires, though, by the end of this year. On the ATV? Yeah. No, you'd be fine. It's mm. only done two rough trips, really. You'd be oh, fine. I know. That's the thing. The thing was like a farm princess. Yeah. Until last <laughs> we year. Broke we broke it in in Utah. We went to Utah. It was like a farm ATV. Like, I had it just literally solely for, like, burn piles and horse poop. <laughs> and now it's like backcountry princess yeah it's doing good that's a really good side by side yeah arctic cat textron to get it at bass pro yeah it's very good i like it and that's the cool thing too about that is our the atv repair guy in sheridan was like dude these things are bomb proof mm-hmm. and they have to be i caught that thing on fire oh yeah that's right classic literally well it was i didn't catch it on fire i had pack rats two of them obviously if you guys follow me online you know i have a pack rat problem in oregon like massive (laughs) and i had two pack rats build a nest in my side by side and i didn't realize it and i went up there fired it up and i'm burning slash and doing whatever thank god i had water and a hose and there's my side by side like burning and i'm like what is that and i lifted up the bed and the flipping thing's on fire so i Put it out with a hose. Luckily, my dad has a boom truck, and he boomed it up, and we took the skid plate off the bottom. And two rats come bombing out, and (laughs) full, luckily we put a tarp down, full of debris underneath there, and it caught on fire. One of the rats ran, and my dog chased it, and it ran up into my dad's engine of his truck. And then my dog's, like, jumping on the side of my dad's Chevy, and I'm like, ah! (laughs) Jeez, because Kruger's tried to kill a rat, and I'm like, Dad, you need to put, like, a trap in your truck now. He's like, oh, it's fine. So what's he do? He puts it in my mom and him's shop, and the next morning he starts the truck, and there's, like, blood under his truck. Like, I don't know what happened, but that rat got (laughs) throttled. Fan belt, probably. Something, like, something got the rat. I mean, like, and he never even dug it out. I don't, I think he's rotted in there. It's probably still in there, yeah. (laughs) Disgust. Like, so bad. Like, you should have saw. I actually videoed the rats coming out of there. Jeez. It was so bad. <laughs> but that place still, like, we were just there, and there's mice in the garage, and we're putting mice traps out. There's another rat building a nest under the shoot house. We mm-hmm. have to bring some more rat traps out there. And, yeah, that thing literally caught on fire. Thank God I had a, a hose, and it's still going. Still trucking, baby. Yeah, but side by side. Apart from, from rats, they can pretty much survive anything 
Yeah. <laughs> Even Yogi driving. Even me driving, yes. I know Robbie was dying. He's an old trucker, and he's like, Yogi hits every rock. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, he's actually. beat me to death on this thing. <laughs> I did not hit every rock. I tried mm. to avoid most of them, but there's rocks everywhere out yeah. here. He had fun driving it, though. Yeah. Yeah, he enjoyed that. I That's almost fun. fell asleep on the back because he was going so slow. <laughs> Yogi's like, are we running out of gas? <laughs> Why are we going so slow? <laughs> like, sorry, Robbie, my husband's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Mm-hmm. No, they're very handy. Very handy. I don't think you'd be... Like, and I was always that person, like, I don't want a side-by-side. Uh. I was raised with my dad. We had mules. But on this hunt, in this unit... <laughs> you'd be, yeah. A but Cliff, same thing. Same that thing. unit, yeah. It'd be a rough hunt without it. Yeah. Because you got to cover so much ground. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And Nick, you were really helpful in this because you were like basically backstage passes to where Ben hunted last year. Yeah. Stole all the spots. I know. Sucker. Sucker. <laughs> well, which is. We <laughs> but did, we didn't kill in no, his spots. We, we killed in our own spot. spots. Oh. We had our own spots. So I mean, he, he didn't give you really good spots, to be honest. No, he gave us the decoy spots. <laughs> well, so here, there is a slight family conflict. Uh, my cousin Gus, his cousin his wife's cousin is hunting and so gus has taken him to all those spots so they might be holding some back that titus <laughs> yeah. intel might be on the mm-hmm. hold back and then ben's like well maybe when gus is done he can give you some pointers on where to go <laughs> i'm like punks yeah <laughs> well, <laughs> typical they, they have uh, a challenge for them not try to find anything more special than what you just killed so yeah, it was a cool buck. Yeah, I don't think... Uh, it's not going to be easy to find anything like that. No, I mean, super cool. I don't know, like, what size of shoe, that, shoe are you, Nick? 12. You can fit that thing easy in between the horns there. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Like, that thing is wide. Yeah. yeah. You're looking at it over there. It's just like this big V. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's a beautiful buck. And yeah. that's one of the things, like, my dad had this tag a couple of years ago. And Nick and my dad and I rode on the donkeys... Yeah, I mean, we were antelope hunting on donkeys, so it was slow. Yeah. Real slow. But and we were still putting 20, 30 miles on the mules every, yeah, you know. A few days. Yeah. But it was slow hunting, and everybody gets tired, and, you know, it's just, you're, you're not seeing the country. And so the antelope you see, it's like, well, we're in this one zone, and we're on mules, and this is what we should choose from. And my dad got the best buck for, you know, what we found in that zone for at, sure. the t- at the time. But, um, you know, if that's, you know, that's the thing too with, with hunting, you have to look at, you know, how you want to hunt with, do you want to hunt on a side by side and cover a million miles and try to really dig out a big one? Or do you want to stick true to like, Hey, this is how I like to do it. And this is the experience I want. And I'm going to take the best animal I can and have the experience that I want for my hunt. And that's how my dad, my dad's true to that to this day, like. Might not kill the best thing. I might not kill anything at all, but I'm going to enjoy the scenery on the back of my mule. And mm-hmm. we always joke, you know, about him and Robbie. They don't really want to hunt. They just want to go on a donkey ride. Well, that's <laughs> pretty true. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's part of it. Like even for us, we, we enjoy this way of hunting that we do, you know, trying to find animals, glassing and everything, looking at, looking over a lot of pretty country. and. Well, they have a hard time sitting down and glassing. Well, that's too. Patience, well, they we'll don't have that. Well, we'll sit for hours, yeah. and some people will set up a camp and sit the same spot for two days yeah. and not move. They won't do that. Yeah, that's right. I remember when we were in Hell's Canyon with your dad and Robbie two or three years ago. Yeah. I can't remember. Two years ago. And we are spring bear hunting, and... Because of the terrain, I'd never been in there then, but because of the terrain and the way it looked, it reminded me of how we used to spring grizzly bear hunt and black bear hunt in BC. And we would sit and watch a mount, like a mountainside that we knew the bears were on every spring mm-hmm. for days. We just, every day we would go there and just sit and glass and glass and glass. We did the same thing in Hell's Canyon. Yeah. And your dad. We I saw almost 30 different bears. Yeah. And your dad, I don't think he understood no. when we started doing it. And he was, you know, patient saying he, he wanted to go riding and doing and exploring and stuff. But then when we started picking out bears every day consistently, different ones too. Yeah. The problem with like, them, you couldn't get to them. That's the other thing. But I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. like. Like, oh, there's a bear. Mm. Yeah. You have to adapt Gnarly your, yeah. you have to adapt your um, way of hunting to the type of terrain you're in for sure. And the, obviously the species you're hunting, but. On this kind of hunt, and the same with the Bookcliffs hunt, you have to cover a lot of miles. And if it's just you doing it, then you have to be in a lot of different spots 
during the seven to ten day time frame. Yeah. Whereas if you have multiple people helping you hunt in different spa- uh, places, they can just go and get scout for you and glass, and then yeah. you know you communicate and you just go to the the spot where they find the good one. Yeah. They, they made that illegal in a lot of places. They do. They, well, like that, in Utah, we had that happen to us. That's for outfitted hunts. I yeah. Think. Well, we were hunting and you know looking for deer, and we found a good buck. The buck I ended up shooting, mm-hmm. and we passed on it. And the next day, another guy had seen it. We saw him on the road. And he called someone. We watched him make a phone call in my spotting scope. And the next day, there was an outfitter in there, and they had that thing locked down. Like, mm-hmm. every access point, there was probably 15 cars. Jeez. It was in... I wanted to just cry because mm-hmm. I'm like, man, that was my backup deer. Yeah. You know, not that... You can't ever count on finding an animal. Sure. But that mentally, like, that was... Yeah. But they never did pick them out, and we ended or up getting Or they passed them. on them. Do you know what or, yeah. But, yeah. It's hard it, to say. That's how they get effective, though. But they, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's frustrating. I mean, you're limited to how far you can see, mm-hmm. how many miles you can go, and then how much time you're willing to put in. Yep. It's also about having fun, though. You know, I mean, that, obviously, you want to try to get something and be as effective as possible and try to get a really good representative of the species for that unit, you know. Yeah. Or for your effort. I mean, for your the, effort. the best you can find for your effort. Right, for sure. Um, but, I mean, um, it's all it's the main thing is about having fun i think and yeah. enjoying it because you know you're doing something that you love and yeah. you're in beautiful locations like this is a beautiful unit yeah, yeah. these gorgeous. mountains are insanely beautiful well and robbie went out here on his donkeys and he packed in camped and shot a 16 and a quarter inch buck that he chased on his mules pretty much back to the road <laughs> <laughs> smart man <laughs> he killed it right off the road so they shoot the antelope literally like a quarter mile off the road. They pack it out on the mules, and then he had to ride all the way back in and break <laughs> his spike camp and come back out. But I mean, he's been the he's been the uh, he's been the golden ticket winner so far for this unit for us. I mean, that over sixteen inches in here. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty impressive. But yeah, for sure. I mean, you think about how many people we know that have had this tag and have not harvested a buck like that. Like he. And he's he's an older guy. He's hunted, and he. I'm glad he got a big one. You know, good for him. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy to do for any of us. No, for sure. Except for Nick. <laughs> Nick, you've also got the golden ticket. You killed a monster bull. Killed a couple of years you. in a row now. Yeah. Monster. Well, you got that big one with your bow. Yeah, he was nice. Yeah. Unicorn point. Yeah. Weird dude. Yeah. And the one last year was a stag-looking weirdo, yeah. but. Yeah, you've been doing good. I'll take it. Now you get to do <laughs> Don't ask me about the years before those two, but <laughs> <laughs> the last two years it's looking good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's all about the m- memories, eh? You create. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 100%. And I mean, if you don't if you don't tag out, but if you put in all the effort, then that's how it is. I yeah. mean, you still have the memory to live off on and, yeah. you know, if you do it with friends, which you normally do, you normally, you normally don't go solo, you know, you do it with friends or yeah. family. And it's good times, right? Well, Nick and I were here for my deer hunt, and I think, I mean, some of my most, like, hardcore hunts have been with you, Mm -hmm. and that deer hunt in the Steens in 2018 was by far the most exhausted hunt that I've ever been on. Yeah, it was really... And you would, you would, like, really we've she- hunted rough. sheep, we've hunted yeah. moose, we've hunted goats. Caribou. Caribou. And that deer hunt in this unit, I have never been so tired. It was a butt kicker. For like, sure. ground out. I rolled my ankle in some animal hole. It was swollen for three months. <laughs> like, crawled out. We left, like, $10,000 worth of gear on the side of the mountain, and we're like, F it. Yeah. <laughs> Come back tomorrow. I am not packing this off. We came back the next day. Robbie brought his mules in and took it the rest of the way out. But yeah, that was one of the rougher pack outs. Getting back at two a.m. and <sighs> just just wait until this fall, Nick. Wanting to die. Ten mile hike one way. Yeah, I think my my ankle was a little swollen <laughs> from that hole I got in on this trip. So yeah, I, you uh, did the same thing too, <laughs> but you didn't su- suffer the injuries nope, that I they did. Held up. God, yeah. <laughs> that sucked because my ankle was toast. Like we, used th- I was like, thank God we're done. Like western hunting we moved right into whitetail because i rolled my ankle going across jim and leanne's food plot in indiana i was like ah! <laughs> i thought died trying to get in my tree stand <laughs> couldn't even hardly walk to go potty like it was just brutal yeah 
<laughs> yeah, that was a rough one. But that was that was seriously one of the hardest hunts. I was so thankful for the deer we shot. And the expectation, I think, at a lot of... Even with our Utah hunt, I mean, people... You guys, we all watch stuff online. And we all get so wrapped up in social media. And these big animals that are being taken. And it's not the norm. It's the exception. Mm-hmm. And um, I think a lot of times it's easy to get caught up in that. And you stop... Like, you just need to appreciate the opportunities that you have. Yeah. Well, I think people build it up in their head with, you know, seven points or 16 points. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, they expect to, like, just walk into this mecca of big animals. Which some places, it's like that. Sure. Less and less, it's like that now. Yeah. -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you look at the tag numbers issued in this unit, for example, for pronghorn. It's around 110 a year. And we put it on a lot of miles. And we've seen four to five times as many horse more even than like feral horses than antelope in this unit and they're still issuing 110 tags a year and we i want to say we're one of the hardest hunting party in this unit probably for this tag this year and we are having a hard time digging up good good bucks you know and it's that just tells you it's the tag numbers and some units in some states they need to lower them mm-hmm. or change the system because the way it's going, they're just keeping the, the tag numbers high because people want to go hunting. It's going to, and then combined with it in this unit, like a, a feral horse problem where the horses are pushing uh, the wild game out of the, uh, you know, the water sources and the feeding spots. And mm-hmm. it's just, it's a, um, a downward spiral, you know, in the long run. And it's, the numbers are not going to get better and something has to be done about it because like you said nick people have expectations especially with an antelope tag that takes 16 years to draw (laughs) when you can go to wyoming and shoot the antelope that you see in this unit every year every year as a resident as a resident or or if you're a non-resident you go and you put in three one to one to three points sometimes no points and in the the quality of animal is the same Mm mm-hmm gonna advertise that so people are all over your antelope hunt now or what yeah well i live in wyoming (laughs) so i have more tag draws that's why we moved (laughs) we can draw Mm. you know i mean that's one of the things that's really hard here in this state like you wait i've had i've hunted antelope twice in my lifetime like that's that's it like everything you take in this unit when you're an oregon resident or any antelope for that matter is a true trophy here because the, the opportunity is so small and, and you come here with this expectation and we have seen so many people like not just hunters there is a huge number of non-hunters here yeah. sightseeing. big tourist attraction yeah oh like yeah unbelievable amount of traffic with backpackers and hikers and sightseers and hunters and mm-hmm. you have and for it being a quote-unquote wilderness area huh, there's it gets hammered, people yeah. everywhere yeah. There, there's honestly more traffic on this gravel road out here than on the highway between Burns and Bend. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's That's crazy. Yeah. 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 That's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. There are so many people out here. But with that said, good for them for coming and enjoying the mountains. That's what we're all here for. But it just means that, like, when you go to dig out an animal, you, you have to work harder. But then it's also awkward as a hunter because you're out here with a firearm and you're hunting and people are stopping and they're like, ah. What's your gun for? Yeah. What are you hunting? What, what are you looking what at? What are you looking at? What? Oh, you see an animal, and it's just awkward. It's like, dude, don't just. I have a gun. Leave me alone. I'm hunting. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I don't want to talk to people like that. Am yeah. I weird? I'm not sure. Yeah. Like, I would never stop, and be like, Oh, hey, Mister Hunter, you have a gun. What are you doing? Yeah. What do you think I'm doing? Yeah. Like, it's <laughs> like, and it's almost like they're shocked that people are hunting here. Like that hunting is a means of management for wildlife and they're like almost blown away that mm-hmm. you would have, that you would be hunting. Oh, there's, there's hunting here. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, there's, <laughs> this is the wilderness. <laughs> well, not really, but. Yeah. Do you whatever. remember that bike race in Utah when you shot your bike? Oh yeah. In the, <laughs> the book list, there was a bike race going on. No way. <laughs> yeah. So we been. Are you Yogi, a mountain bike race? Yeah. yeah like Yogi, no way. Yogi, we pass on the buck. Ben and I are out another spot. Yogi's glassing. And he's like, I, I saw a buck. Best, the biggest framed one I saw was like two miles away. I have no idea what it is. But if you and Ben want to go check it out, you should go do that. So Ben and I go check out where he had last seen this buck. 
and had no idea what it was. And we get over there and dig around and whatever. We end up finding the herd of deer. And it's a buck that I'd passed on like two days, three days, whatever before. This is the second to last day of season. And I, we belly crawl out. We get set up at like 330 yards from the buck. I set up my tripod and I get on the deer and they're all gone. And I'm like, what just happened? And Ben's like, they saw us belly crawling. I'm like, no, they didn't, Ben. They were like bedding and like feeding under a tree, getting ready to go down for the day. They did not see us belly crawl. (laughs) And I look over to the right and some guy had rode his uh, pedal bike. There was like a bicycle race. Had rode his pedal bike. I like here I'm getting ready to shoot this animal and he's riding a pedal bike around and it just goes to show you that when you're on public land you have to really be like aware of, you know, knowing your target, what's beyond, because you never know yeah. who's on the other side, mm-hmm. right? Like in some weird situation like that. So then the anal or the bucks all spook. So Ben and I go put another stock on. We get two hundred yards from the deer. We don't realize it's the deer. We spook a bunch of deer. The buck's not there. We back up. We get like almost like 550 yards, whatever, from the hillside where we saw the buck. And we relocate the buck. And Ben's like, well, do you want to go back and try to get closer? And I was like, no, I'm just going to lay down prone and shoot. And I shot. I made a good shot. Buck goes down. We get to the buck. Literally, as soon as we get to the buck, guys on motorcycles right through there. And I'm like, thank God we shot him when we did because wow. bicycles and motorcycles mm-hmm. ripping through. Like, it, I mean, it was crazy the amount of recreational traffic um, we experienced there. And the same thing is in this unit, too. Like, the recreational traffic um, from non hunters um, is, is really is really um, almost greater than the hunting population here. Well, it it is for sure. It's not as regulated. Like the hunting is really regulated. Yeah. To the seasons and the tag numbers, whereas like regular tourism, sightseeing, hiking is not as regulated. And then like in that Utah unit, especially dirt bikes could go anywhere. Yeah. Like especially on the desert floor, they didn't care. Yeah, they they were were driving ripping around out there. (laughs) Like, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I would told Ben, I'm like, I'm so glad we didn't try to get closer because if we would have done an active stock and tried to get closer, then it would have been actually yeah. it was 650. I take it was 650 mm-hmm. where I shot 650. from. Yeah, and that's why I was kind of like, eh, I don't know. That was the longest shot I've ever taken on a on a hunt. Was that was that deer shot um, at 650? But I was scared if we tried to push closer that something was going to happen and we were going to lose the buck. It was second to last day of season. We were, you know, kind of against the clock. And, you know, like I said, I was prone, got good data, felt comfortable. My cousin is really good at long-range shooting and, uh, you know, just gave me a really good peace of mind on my wind hold. And, you know, we, we collaborated on it. And I mean, I'm not saying everybody should go take long shots. Don't. I'm not saying that. And I'm not saying I always do that. I'm just saying in that situation, it was a comfortable yeah, right. I it's was nice to have the tool doing. in your yeah, yeah. tool belt. Sometimes to the terrain does not give you another option, right? Yeah. And then it's good to yeah. have the skill to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. it was it was like, the, and up here was kind of the same thing. But up here, the biggest, I think the biggest limiting factor was the horses. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, yeah. they were the biggest foobar on a lot of situations. But they didn't blow anything for us, I guess, specifically. It was just... Uh, the, the, in general, they're blowing it for hunters here because they're pushing the game out out of this area yeah and and the antelope are in with the, i mean it's crazy because the antelope are so integrated within the horse herds that they're almost like i don't think incestual is the right word but they're just together mm-hmm. they're in the same feeding areas the same they're living in the same habitat and the competition has to be affecting them yeah well, for like sure. there's no way because everywhere there was antelope there was horses yeah and they outnumbered them by yeah one to five ten to one or, or whatever ten to it was. one you know it's crazy yeah yeah they're so much bigger too as an animal yeah. right like they push them out no yeah. no problem competing for the same yeah. water the same feed same mm-hmm. cover um yeah it's who knows what's gonna and happen and they don't have it. to worry about predators as much as antelope antelope do yeah yeah so but we pulled it off we did boom Bam. yeah so what's your biggest takeaway from this hunt mine are you putting the pressure on me of my course. biggest takeaway you close it out. not asking me oh boy <laughs> i would i would have asked you but no my biggest thing on this one is um 
you know, we're cashing out Oregon tags, you know, Oregon, my Oregon points. And, um, uh, you know, I'm just glad to do it with people that I care about. You're here. Nick's here. Robbie was here. I wish my dad would have been here. Um, you know, it's, 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 you know, you come to a place like this that you've hunted so many times and you have so many great memories is very nostalgic and, and rolling into Wyoming, you know, we're not going to have any of that and we have to start over and, you know, all these great memories that we have and all these great honey holes that we have, um, you know, it's kind of a bittersweet thing. Luckily we get to come back for deer. My dad and I drew this deer tag, so we'll be back in October, um, to finalize, you know, our last deer hunt here in Oregon. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to have spent this antelope season with all of you, and, and that's my biggest takeaway, you know? Right back at you. Good. Yeah. It's been fun. Because I don't like very many people, so um, I really like <laughs> I really like Nick, and I really like Yogi, and I like Robbie, so it's good. No, I do like people. I'm just I'm just actually a difficult person to get along with, so. Oh, man. I've discovered and that. And you add your dad and Robbie into oh. it, and we got a camp full of misfits. Yeah. Hence the margaritas. <laughs> That's just survival. <laughs> what's your, what's your, I, this was your first time here. What was your takeaway? Um, I was just frustrated by the amount of horses we saw, like, compared to antelope, like, in, and you're trying to hunt, you know. But that, you were also frustrated by the lack of, like, when we're in Wyoming, and you're kind of spoiled, we have antelope everywhere. Mm. And he's like, this is a trophy unit. And there's hardly any animals right, that, here. Well, like, I was going to get to that. Like the, yeah. the combination of, like we've touched on earlier in this podcast, the combination of the number of tags issued for this unit with it being a 16-year wait for most people and then the the minimal number of antelope that yeah. you actually get to see even though you're putting on a lot of miles. And then in relation to the number of, well, of feral horses you see here is mind-blowing. And that, to me, that was the biggest takeaway. Obviously, I really enjoyed this week hunting yeah. here, of course, with all of you. And it was a great hunt and beautiful scenery, like beautiful mountains, cool terrain. It reminded you of Australia. In a lot of places or Africa because it's so deserty and, and dry. Uh, some places in th- South Africa and Namibia are very similar to this in Australia to where we do the water buffalo hunts. But um, like that, you know, just the realization that there's not that many antelope here for yeah. it being a trophy unit with a 16 year wait and then you have this feral horse problem on top of on top of that you know it's just such a weird scenario mm-hmm. in my mind so. Nick oh what's my takeaway yeah um, he says every time I'm never you, hunting with you again you can't say I'm never what we hunting said. with you again <laughs> he says it every time I'm not doing it I'm not coming back with you Christy <laughs> yeah no kidding I That's hate you good. <laughs> uh, my biggest takeaway is I think it's just Another one where, you know, because we've hunted this unit a lot, it's if you come to the Steens, you put your head down, you do your thing, you grind it out, Short and eventually nights. you'll turn up what you need. But you just got to do your thing and not worry about everyone else and the other people and just out hunt them. them. And just, yeah, this it's a hard place to hunt. And, you know, you're kind of a, a five-day warrior. You got five days to come in, not only film a show, but have enough animals for a show, get enough encounters, and then find a respectable animal that you actually want to take so it was just another five day grind and got her done yes i'm actually thankful we got it done in our time frame yeah because i was a less little, than five days yeah i was a little i don't know and then i thought well when nick goes home yogi and i could stay because the season's technically not over on thursday yeah. like we could keep hunting through the weekend if we need to and you know, and it, it is hard because, like, as a hunter, you're you're passing on nice looking animals that are that are beautiful animals. And I and I always say this, like, I don't want to discredit the beauty or the value in an animal. No, hundred percent not. When you wait sixteen years, and you're like, man, I got this many days, and it's you know an an average nice buck. Like, okay, if I think I can find an average nice buck later in this week, then let's look for something that's more stand up. Which we were really lucky to, lucky to find. Yeah, yep. You got a beautiful bike. Yeah. And now we just got to break camp, and um, we haven't showered in um, very long time, and it's like over six digits in temperature. I feel like in some days, and we've been hiking and sweating. I don't know if I've ever been so stinky in my life. Like I can smell myself, and it's really bad when we get in the car and I can't smell your feet. That's bad. Because that means we all smell really bad. Like I feel bad walking into the into the French Glen store like 
I'm so I'm pretty sorry sure they about get the way I lot. smell. Yeah. There's a lot of hunters coming through there. Yeah, I, I apologize in advance. I can't smell myself. I'm sure you can. And when I leave, you're going to talk about me. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> the only thing I could smell all week was Nick's, de- uh, not deodorant, sunscreen. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I don't use that stuff. I'm not was, burnt. Look at that tan line. Oh, the okay, tan okay, line. That. Yeah, that's you did good. get it. No, tan. that's a dirt line. I bronzed. Like this like one. Look at, look at this. Yeah. I've washed my bottom head of my legs. Uh, if you guys are watching this, do not uh, make fun of the hair that's on my legs right no. now because... I'm Yogi's used to it because I never shave. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh. Don't put it over here. <laughs> Keep your hairy legs to yourself. <laughs> so disgusting. <laughs> I was going to wear a tank top and then I'm like, eee. people are going to think that I've eaten a lot of granola. So I'm going to keep a t-shirt on. <laughs> it's gross. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to, for a shower tonight. Yes. Yep. Uh, but we're going to wrap this up and. Thank all of you for joining us for this episode of the Wildland Cut Podcast, brought to you by Ruger, Onyx, and Dead Down Wind. And uh, we'll see you all next time from somewhere else in the world. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut Podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.